So my topic is a very broad one. So as with Bob, I'm going to sort of pick uh, a number of um, number of topics that are relevant to American history that involve economics, and just show how you know it's useful to have a sound economic understanding in order to understand American history. It it, it enlightens you. It, it allows you to see things you wouldn't otherwise be able to perceive. I want to start off a little more generically, though, and just say that the impression I got when I was in high school, and that maybe some of you are fortunate enough not to have gotten, but believe me, this is the standard view, is that if you have a free market economy and you don't have government intervention, the result is kids are working in mines and you know getting their arms blown off and uh, everybody has to work like 120 hours a week for two cents an hour. Everybody's pretty much crawling around in the dirt searching for worms for sustenance. And the economy is basically dominated by little short men with white mustaches carrying sacks of money with dollar signs on them. <laughs> I, mean, th I mean, that is by and large, that is the view I got. And, and I remember going through high school thinking, how could people be so stupid, you know, and not as sophisticated as I am? You know, they, they don't understand that we need wise overlords to administer everything because otherwise we'd be at the mercy of these guys on the, on the top of the monopoly package. You know, like, what, what? What uh, what would it take to get people to realize the folly, the error of their ways? And so, of course, the standard view is that, well, thankfully, s some unspecified government intervention has rescued us from this, and we don't have these problems anymore. And so one of the assumptions is that labor unions must have probably solved this problem, right? Because labor unions force employers to pay higher wages, and that solves the problem. Well, at its height, Labor unionism in the U.S. may have reached one out of three workers at its absolute height. Uh, the American workers have typically been the least unionized, or at least among, uh, among the lowest, lowest unionized in the developed world, certainly compared to Europe. Europe's workers were much more heavily unionized, and yet somehow, without the unions to protect them from the terrible exploiters, American workers consistently were the best paid and compensated. Uh, we see this in the, in the 20s and, and uh, really throughout American history. Well, that's not supposed to be possible, right? I mean, that's, that's, not, that's the opposite of what we're, we're told. How could this have happened? So I want to just start off with a little thought experiment and then go from there to try to explain how it is that we have grown to enjoy and become accustomed to the standard of living we have and show it has absolutely nothing to do with government. The only thing the government can do in terms of the average standard of living is disrupt and uh, diminish it. That's, that's all it can do. That it's entirely due to the free market, entirely due to the wicked private sector and the wicked exploiters that we have the standard of living we enjoy. And so this, the thought experiment runs like this. Let's suppose all the machinery that we use to produce things is just suddenly destroyed, like there's some mad unibomber who's got this incredible bomb that can destroy all productive machinery. And it goes off. So we've got nothing. We've got to make everything by hand. Well, what would happen in that economy? I mean, how much stuff could we create? Well, not a lot, right? We, you know, we'd be sitting there with our bare hands saying, you know, I'm not producing very much over here, okay? So what, what would that look like? Well, we would have scarcity of everything. Everything would exist in far, far lower quantities than we're accustomed to. There'd be plenty of goods we couldn't produce at all. I mean, you know, tr try producing a uh, trolley car from beginning to end by hand. You get all, get all, the, all the raw materials and resources, do all that by hand. Can't be done, right? So let's imagine, though, we lose all the machines, but we all decide, you know what, I think I'm just going to keep working 40 hours a week. I'm just going to keep working 40 hours a week. Now, let's compare how much stuff we could produce working 40 hours a week with our bare hands, with no machines, no capital goods to help us, and compare that to what we could produce with these machines in 40 hours a week. Well, obviously, in 40 hours a week with these machines, we can produce basically, you know, the abundance we see around us today. But if, we, if we've got 40 hours with these crummy hands of ours per week, how much stuff are we, are we producing? I mean, a tiny, tiny sliver, the tiniest sliver of what we used to, 
of what we used to produce. So when you get your paycheck in that situation, the non-machine economy situation, you get your paycheck, when you go out to spend it, what are you going to find? Everything's very expensive because everything's very scarce and so is commanding a very high price. You have to work very hard and very long to earn the purchasing power necessary to buy the things you want. Now, would that situation be the fault of the terrible exploiter who's employing you? Would that be his fault? that you can't get very much stuff with your paycheck? Do we need labor unions to get your, your pay to go up 10 times? What would that help if there ain't no stuff to buy anyway? What if we, what if we paid you 100 trillion Zimbabwean dollars? Would that help the situation? If there ain't no stuff to buy, it doesn't matter. You can, your wages and keep going up and up and up. The problem is the stuff isn't there. So this is not the, pro this is not the fault of the exploiter, so-called, who's employing you. It's the fault of reality. It's the fault of the fact that the economy is so freaking primitive, it can't produce the physical stuff necessary to give you the standard of living you're accustomed to. Well, that is exactly the economy that people living in the early Industrial Revolution were living in. A very primitive economy with very primitive machines and still a lot of goods being produced by hand. And people, people are sort of of the opinion that the reason workers weren't being paid very much in those days was that evil capitalists were keeping all the wealth to themselves. But the problem was that there wasn't much wealth in the first place. That's the problem. What that economy needed wasn't more government wealth redistribution. It needed more machines so that we can produce more stuff, so that the stuff will exist in greater abundance, so that it's not so expensive, and therefore my paycheck can stretch farther and farther to be able to purchase more and more stuff. That's what that economy needed. Whereas, if we simply were to persist in this situation where we've got, we've got very few machines, very, very, very primitive production process, and just hope that through agitation or, or legislation, let's pass a law saying that everybody gets a TV set and a new hat and whatever. Well, again, the reason that the workers in that situation don't have TV sets and hats is not that the relatively very few rich people are hoarding all the television sets. It's that there aren't any television sets. It's not that the relatively few rich people are hoarding all the furniture and all the meat. It's that there is relatively little furniture and meat being produced. So that even if we took all the stuff of the guys with the white mustaches and the sacks of, of money, even if we took all their stuff and redistributed it, the result for the average person would be completely negligible. You wouldn't even notice the improvement in your standard of living. Okay, you'd have an extra one penny. That's it. And also on top of that, there is the moral problem. You know, stealing is probably a bad thing. But just from a practical point of view, there aren't enough of these guys to go around anyway. So again, the problem is not that somehow greedy people in the midst of the darkness of the night, skulking around the, the edges of the night, leaped out and grabbed everything one night. They got all the TV sets. No, the problem is that well, we just simply need more investment in capital goods that can produce more stuff, make the economy more physically productive. That's what happens in a market economy. When you're not looting and stealing and condemning people as exploiters, what they are instead doing, what they're allowed to do, is take their profits and pour them into investment, in machinery that makes the productive process more productive, can produce more stuff, and the greater abundance leads to lower prices and higher real wages for everybody. There is absolutely nothing whatsoever the government can do to assist in that process. All it can do is hamper that process by taxing these people, by taking their wealth away, and thereby depriving us of the funds that society needs for the capital goods to allow us to be able to produce more stuff. There's nothing government can do to make this process any better. All it can do is make it worse.